Let's go to Genesis 13. Let's go there first, and we'll take a look at a few things. This will actually be, the map will be at the end of the message, and we will get to it, Lord willing. But Genesis 13 to start. So Genesis chapter 13, and we will read the last five verses of the chapter. So we'll go down there to verse 14. So Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Abram, After that, Lot was separated from him. Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for being able to just read these scriptures again and uh, look at some things from a long time ago that are certainly uh, right, uh, very applicable, applicable to where we are today, just right at home. And I pray that this message, uh, Lord, you would take it and do something with it. Pray that we would all be faithful hearers, and then also we would put into action these things that you lay before us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you be in charge of this message and uh, nothing be said that you don't want to be said. Uh, Lord, just uh, move in our hearts tonight using your spirit and your word, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so by way of introduction, we're going to have a little fun. What chapter are we in? 13. You ought to pay attention to numbers in your Bible, right? Now, I don't want to go much into this, but I'll just give you my perspective on this, and if you disagree, that's okay. Uh, I don't believe that these these numbers in your Bible, the chapter and verse divisions, first off, they weren't added until uh, sometime later. And I don't necessarily think that they're given by inspiration. I believe the words are given by inspiration. But I'm telling you what, I believe that God had his hand, his providential hand was present when these verses were put into place. And I'll show you why. So inspired, I, would, I wouldn't say that necessarily, but, but hand of God involved for sure. So we're in chapter 13, and I did not read the first 13 verses. Before I read, uh, we're actually back up to chapter 1 in a minute of Genesis, but before I read and we talk about number 13, let me just ask you, what comes to mind when you hear number 13 from a worldly perspective? Unlucky. Now, isn't it interesting that when we go through this, you'll, you'll realize the world has some insight, a little bit, but they don't understand why things are the way they are. And I would not say unlucky. Let's take a look at what the Bible says number 13 is about. I'm not going to tell you this. We're going to let the Bible tell you. So chapter 1 of Genesis. I thought this is very interesting, and we've been through some of this before. So if it's a repeat, well, it's good for you, isn't it? So chapter 1. Now, I won't take the time to read all these verses, but I want you to just do a quick look here as we go through a few of the verses in the chapter. First off, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. It's a good place to start, isn't it? God created the heaven and the earth. Now look at verse 2. Can you find God in verse 2? Yes. It says Spirit of God. How about verse 3? Do you see God in verse 3? Yes, God said. How about verse 4? And God saw the light. Yes. 4 for 4 so far. 5. Yes, God called the light day. Uh, how about verse 6? Yes, God said. Verse 7? Yes. Verse 8? Yes, verse 9, oh yes, verse 10, 11, 12, all yeses, everybody with me? 1 through 12, yes, 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 all the way to 12. We'll look at 13. For, isn't that interesting? The first verse in the Bible that does not have God present in the verse is number 13. Now, where do you go if you don't have God? What's the result, I should ask? Without God, what happens? Read the book of Judges. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know what that is? That's going against God. That's called rebellion. Now, just so you nail this down, chapter or number 13 in your Bible is rebellion. Now go over to chapter 13. I'll show you something interesting. Just a couple more things here on 13. We could do all night on this 13 thing, but I'll just show you a couple more things. Chapter 13, we did not read verse 13. 
But verse 13 is very interesting. So chapter 13, verse 13. Let's take a look at it. Let's read. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. You see any rebellion in that verse? That is the first time. You can look at this on your own. That's the first time the word sinner, in this case it's plural, sinners, is in your Bible. And the first time the word sinner shows up, it's uh, isn't it interesting who's, who's mentioned there. The men of Sodom. The men of Sodom would be called Sodomites. Is that a sin that's present in our world today? That is rebellion against God? You see how your Bible is more up to date than the morning news? Okay, now count the words in verse 13. I know some of you have seen this before, but this is interesting. Count the words. What do you come up with? In chapter 13, verse 13, first book of the Bible, you just happen to have 13 words. Now, I, w I haven't done the study, uh, but it would be interesting to look at some of the other versions of the Bible. See if they have less or more than 13 words. That would take away from that, wouldn't it? You start messing with words, you get all messed up. Now, chapter 14. Let's read here. Let's uh, read a few verses. Verse 1, chapter 14 of Genesis. Came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariot, king of Elasar, Kedor Laamor, king of Elam. And notice this, Tidal, king of nations. Bunch of united nations way back then, huh? It says that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Beersha, king of Gomorrah, uh, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemaber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. Now watch the wording here as we go these next two verses. All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Look at verse 4. Twelve years they served Kedor Laamor, and in the thirteenth year, what'd they do? See, the, let the Bible define what numbers mean, and that verse right there just nails it down, doesn't it? That number 13 is connected, I mean, time and time again with rebellion. Now, when uh, our, our uh, American uh, ancestors came over here from Great Britain, how many colonies, how many original colonies? 13, and you're saying America's a rebellious nation? Well, kind of, because why did they come over here? That it was a rebellion against uh, what was going on over there in England. They wanted some uh, religious freedom. So interesting stuff there. So go to Mark chapter 7. I'll, last one I'll show you just for fun. Mark chapter 7. I'll give you a New Testament example here. Number 13, rebellion. You ever been in an elevator? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12? 14. I'm, I'm not making that up. That's true. Why do they do that? The world, though, no, I'm not talking about Bible believers. The world knows there's something wrong with number 13, don't they? I've known base, baseball players are really bad about being superstitious, and I knew baseball players that would never wear number 13 because it's unlucky. And uh, isn't that interesting that the world knows something, but they don't know what, and they don't know why. The Bible tells you it's, it's not unlucky, it's rebellion, that number 13. Uh, look at Mark chapter 7, verse 21. 721. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed. Now count the number of things that come out of the heart of men. Uh, what is in the heart of men, everyone? It's, it's wicked and deceitful, right? So look at what it says there. Number one, evil thoughts. We'll count them as we go. Two, adulteries. Three, fornications. Four, murders. Thefts, five. Covetousness, six. Uh, wickedness is seven, deceit eight, lascivious is nine, an evil eye, 10, blasphemy, that's 11, pride, that's 12, and foolishness. There's 13 things come out of the heart of men. What is man's heart, everybody? Rebellious. Rebellious. So uh, then it goes on, and all these evil things come from within and defile the man. 13 things come out of man's heart. Uh, that number 13 is rebellion. Now, I wanted to do that for introduction. Go back to thir chapter 13 of Genesis, and let's look at the cure for rebellion. It's right here in the chapter. We read it. So if you go back to Genesis 13, verse 13, you have uh, all those things connected with the number 13, rebellion and uh, wicked and sinners in that verse. What's the cure for rebellion, folks? Look at the first four words of chapter 14. You know what the cure for rebellious heart is? And the Lord said, the cure for rebellious heart is the word of God. The word of God will keep you from being a rebel. Word of God will give you clear direction so that you're not a rebel against what God said. So let's get the first point here. This, this message is, uh, I called it, looking through the Lord's lens. 
And I think it'd probably be appropriate that we begin with point number one being the Lord. Is that a good place to start? Let's talk about the Lord here. It's more specifically in verse 14, that first half of verse 14, I'll read it again. It says, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him. Just, just take that part of verse 14 there. Let's talk about the Lord. Uh, it says there that the Lord began to say something after what happened. Abram and Lot separated from one another. That's earlier in the chapter there, a few verses earlier. You know what makes the, the Lord's voice really, really clear in your life? You'll hear it a lot clear when you separate from things and people that are against God. And I'll talk about this fellow a lot here in a minute. He's got, he's got a heart that is not after the Lord. And uh, he suffered greatly from that. And I know the New Testament calls him righteous Lot and, and all that. And there's some, there's some things about Lot that I suppose are good, although it's hard to find them, isn't it? Uh, chapter, in this chapter here, we'll look at it in a minute. Uh, he makes a really foolish decision based on just what he can see with his eyes, lust of the eyes. And uh, it's interesting how the Lord said something really important to Abram after he separates from Lot. I've noticed in my life, if I take out certain influences, uh, Brother Phil mentioned the, the TV tonight. Man, that can be a really rebellious influence. You take out certain influences. I mean, that was a great, great example of this right here, Brother Phil. You have time to hear the Lord much clearer. Loud and clear. Uh, now, it says there he, he separated from, his, from Lot, which was his nephew. You know, sometimes people can keep you. Certain people that you're around, you need to separate from them so that they don't keep you from hearing the Lord clearly. You're listening to them, and they're keeping you from hearing from the Lord. So I know sometimes you can't do that. I know if you work with somebody, uh, there's certain situations you, you can't necessarily do that. But if you can, then uh, separate from them. It'll, it'll help you hear the Lord's voice much clearer. So how do you overcome a rebellious heart? You do it with the word of God. So I got thinking about this word overcome. Let's look at a couple things here connected with the Lord and overcoming through the Lord. Go to the New Testament here. Go to John 16. So this first thing here will kind of set the stage for us. Looking at things the way the Lord looks at them. There's a buzzword that's going on in at least Christian education, and maybe you've heard it before. It's called worldview. Some of you ever heard that word before? And it's a good word. It's basically how you view the world. And uh, God would have all of us view the world through this lens here, the word of God. You're going to look at the world through some means, you know. You're going to look at and interpret the world through some means. The best way you could do that would be through the lens of God's word. And uh, hopefully I'll give you some things tonight that will show you how, how important that is and, and uh, how to do that. So look at John 16. Look at verse 33. This is the words of Jesus Christ. I love this verse. Good verse of comfort when you're going through a tough time. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ gives you peace? Since he's the prince of peace, he can give it to you. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You know how you overcome the world? You trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And after you get saved, you continually trust in what God said. That's how you, be an overcome, how you can be an overcomer. Uh, go to Romans. These are in order here. Go to Romans 12. I'll show you another thing here on overcoming. And not letting the world bog you down, get you down in the dumps, so that you just go the way of the world and become a rebel. The Lord wouldn't have you be a rebel. He wants you to do right. Look at Romans chapter 12. Go down there to verse 21. Last verse in the chapter. Romans 12, verse 21. Boy, if this does not apply to 2020, oh boy, right up our alley. Look at 1221. Be not overcome of evil. But how do you come over, overcome evil, folks? With good. It says, but overcome evil with good. It's real easy to talk about all the terrible things in the world. We could all do it. We could all just moan and groan and complain tonight, couldn't you? What's the Bible say we ought to do right there? Overcome the evil by good, doing good. How do you know what's good? How do you know what's evil? You, be, you better look at the world through the lens of the word of God or you'll think that certain things that the world says are good are good when the Lord calls them evil. All right, let's go over to 1 John. I've spent some time on that, but I, I might get us off track. Go to 1 John. Go to 1 John. There's, there's a few here in 1 John. We'll just look at a couple. Go to 1 John 4. Another good verse. These, these ought to be encouraging and Especially in this world we live, this rebellious world we live in, these ought to be helpful. 
to encourage you not to go the way of this world. Look at 1 John 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and I've overcome them. Why is that? How do you overcome? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is where? Now, the world's got some power. Let's not deny that. The devil has some power. Let's not deny that. Guess who's got more power? Are you saved? Guess who lives in you? Jesus Christ lives in you. Does anybody have more power than the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, no. So you got the ability through Christ, not on your own, through Christ to overcome and not get beat down and discouraged by the things of this world. Go to 1 John 5, next chapter over. Go to verse, uh, we'll look at 4 and 5. Well, man, these are good verses. 1 John 5, look at verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. What is it, folks? Even our faith. Now, what's that faith in? That faith is in what God said. Your faith is what God said is true. When Pastor mentioned this morning, really hammered that. That was good. What God said is true. That's what overcomes the world. Believe what God said. That matches Genesis 13 perfect. How do you overcome a world of rebellion? You go back and you see what God said. And you apply what God said. You obey what God said. And you, you put that in your heart. Uh, look at verse 5. It says, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? You believe that? Okay, God's given you the ability through Jesus Christ to overcome the world. Uh, a lot of people fear death. Folks, what did the Lord Jesus Christ do after he died? He defeated the thing that we're all so scared of. And we all have a tendency, I mean, even if you're saved, you have a tendency to let this thing creep in and, and fear death. Folks, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, defeated death, what else you got to be afraid of? Uh, that's the... That's a power, death's a powerful thing. And you know why death's a powerful thing? Because the wages of sin is death. So we think about death and say, we just can't escape it. We just can't overcome it. And if the Lord doesn't come back, we're all gonna, we're all gonna die. But since the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, if you're saved, guess what's gonna happen one day? The dead in Christ shall rise first. And you're gonna meet Jesus Christ in the air. So Folks, I, I, I give you this first point here. The Lord, and specifically God's word, is the means of overcoming rebellion. You have a tendency, I have a tendency to have a rebellious heart, even though I'm saved because I'm in this flesh. How to overcome that? Continually drive back to what God said. Just over and over. Replace rebellion with what God said. Replace any wicked thought. Replace any attitude. Go back and replace it with what God said. So there's that first point. Let's go back there to Genesis 13. And uh, let's look, look at verse 14. I gave you that first point there, the first half of verse 14. I'll read you the rest of the verse here. I'll just read the whole verse here, and I'll give you this next point. The Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated unto him. Now, this will be the second point here, beginning in the second half of the verse. Lift up now thine eyes. And what's that next word? So let's talk about that. The look. The Lord says, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it into thy seed. For how long? Forever. Folks, um, do a little compare, actually be a little contrast here. What God gave Abram still belongs to Abraham's descendants, whether the United Nations wants to give it all to them or not. It belongs to Abraham and his descendants. We're talking about the Jews, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 tribes. For how long? Forever. Now, look at Lot. Poor old Lot. Back here in the earlier part of the chapter, look at verse 7. You see what happened to Lot as, by way of contrast and just kind of examining this word, look. And what folks look at. How to think about what we look at. Look at verse 7. There was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the land. Dwelled then in the land. Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. All right, so look what Lot does. Verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes. I want you to take note of that. Let's stop for a moment. Lot lifted up his eyes. Skip over to verse 14. The Lord told Abram to do what? Lift up now thine eyes. 
You got Lot lifting up his eyes. You got Abram lifting up his eyes. What's the difference? The Lord told Abram to lift up his eyes, didn't he? Do you see the Lord anywhere there where Lot lifts up his eyes? Nowhere to be found. Let's see what happens here. Lot lifted up his eyes. Back in verse 10. Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before, isn't this interesting, this little note the Holy Spirit recorded, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Did you notice in that verse, what was Lot's basis for choosing the land that he chose? Lifted up his eyes and he saw something that looked a whole lot like what he saw in Egypt. Guess, guess who took old Lot down to Egypt, by the way? Abram. I say that because Abram, I can relate to this guy. Uh, I, I want to have the faith of Abram. That's one, where, one place where I think I'm, I'm definitely still working on. But I'll tell you, I find myself a lot like Abram. Going the wrong way sometimes. And I think that God put people like, I mean, anybody in your Bible outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's somebody God used in spite of them. And that's a bunch of people right here, amen? Aren't you glad that the Lord will pe use people in spite, will use me and you in spite of us? And I look at that and I say, you know, the only reason Lot went down to Egypt was because old Uncle Abraham took him down there. And uh, that was a mistake. And look at what happens. And I say this because we all have influence, don't we? You better make sure that the people you lead, and everybody leads somebody, if you don't lead anybody up other than yourself, don't lead, be led astray yourself and don't lead others astray. And that's what happened here. Lot makes a decision based on this land looks a whole lot like what I saw down there in Egypt. Now, uh, without belaboring this, is, is there anything good in Egypt in your Bible? No, I can't really find much. What did the Israelites do? They're in Egypt and their, their situation is they're in hard bondage. The Lord delivered them from that bondage. He got them out. So uh, Egypt type of the world over and over in your Bible. Nothing good comes out of Egypt. Guess where the, the worst of Bible manuscripts came from? Just guess. Just guess. Alexandria, Egypt. The good ones came from Antioch of Syria. That's another message, but I have to take a look at that one of these days. That's neat stuff. But uh, nothing good comes out of Egypt. So he makes a decision there based on, uh, you don't have to go over there, but 1 John 2.16 tells you, for the lust of the flesh... Lust of the eyes and the pride of life, three things that are all about making decisions based on this world. What this world will have you do. Um, the things of this world will take you down every time. So notice the contrast there. Lot lifts up his, his eyes and he sees all these great things. Folks, what happened to the place where Lot dwelt? The Holy Spirit recorded it for us there in verse 10, telling us. What happened to that place? The Lord destroyed that place, fire and brimstone. Now, contrast that place, Sodom and Gomorrah, with what God gave Abram. That land belongs to Abraham and his descendants forever. That land that Lot had was only Lot's for a short time. You see what happens when you make decisions after you, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life? Temporary, temporarily it seems okay, but not eternally. Folks, let's make sure you're making, we're all making decisions based on the eternal rather than the temporary. Okay, so let's take a look at this something. Um, it says the, that the Lord told him to look around there, and I, I got to think about this point, the look. And uh, we want to look at things the way the Lord would have us look at things. So how do we do that? A couple things here. Go to 1 Samuel 16. Familiar verse to you? 1 Samuel 16. This is over here where uh, old Samuel's going to anoint the next king over Israel. Saul has failed miserably. And uh, this is where David goes and finds Jesse. The Lord leads him over there. And... Um, Look at verse 6, 16.6. Uh, 6. How does the Lord, we're looking at uh, how the Lord views things, how the Lord looks at things. The Lord does not see things the way we do, I'll tell you that. Look at verse 6. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And look at verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on what? What's the world obsessed with, folks? How people look. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. Aren't people impressed with that? Our buddy, uh, our buddy Daniel's here. The guy's 6'4". I'm telling you, that's intimidating when you're around a guy that tall. When you're not as tall, as I mean. And there's something about the world looks at size and 
outward appearance are just all infatuated with that. So look at what it says. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. Isn't that something? The Lord refuses height and countenance. Uh, nothing against anybody who's tall. Daniel knows I wouldn't, I'm not referring to him, I'm just using him as an example. Nothing against anybody who's tall. Nothing against anybody who's good looking. But look what the Bible says though. Look at it. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on what? The outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on what? The heart. You see all these sons of Jesse go before Samuel, and he refuses every last one of them except for the least likely. Isn't that just like the Lord to use the least likely one? Uh, God uses the foolish of things of this world to confound the things that are, that are mighty and the, the things that the world thinks are wise. So uh, there's one way to look at things. Folks, how should you look at things? Look at things the way the Lord does. The Lord looks on the heart. Now, you can't always see the heart, can you? How do you know what's in somebody's heart, though? Uh, Luke chapter 6, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And you can also see a lot about a person's heart by what they do on a regular basis, habitually do. So you can actually get the Lord's insight on things. I'll tell you this, you cannot make a final decision on somebody's character after you know them for a week. You can't. Now you know them for a year, you got a better idea. So it takes us, you see how, it takes us a long time to figure out something the Lord knows just like that. But the Lord gives us insight on how to do that. It takes, you got to observe for a while. All right, now go over to Daniel chapter 2. I thought this was a neat one. Daniel chapter 2, Old, Old Testament minor, uh, major prophets here. Daniel 2. How does the Lord look at things? Well, a whole lot different than me and you. Who does the, Lord, uh, who does, uh, the world say uh, is great? Give me some names here. Right now, today, 2020, who's great according to the world? You throw our president in there, depending on uh, political persuasion. Some people think he's great. I mean, what's the slogan? Make America great. And how is America going to become great? Well, if he's the president, everything will be great. I mean, I'm just saying this is the philosophy, right? Well, agree or not, I'm not talking about that. But people associate greatness with men, don't they? All right, who else? Give me some more. NBA fans out there? LeBron James, I mean, the guy who's won a couple of titles already and is uh, the, arguably, some people, the greatest player that ever lived. This year, his team that he's uh, playing for went from, man, they were not good last year. This year, they're one of the best teams in the NBA. He's great, right? See what the world looks at? Now, how are they judging that? They're judging that on athleticism. They're judging that on scoring a lot of points and making a lot of money. Who else the world look at is great? I'm not even up on the movies. Hallelujah, I don't keep up with the movies. I couldn't even tell. I couldn't even give you a name. I can go back to the 80s and give you some names, uh, some of those guys. Tom Cruise, I guess, is a, still a name. He's, he's got something coming out here. The only reason I know this is because there's a big movie back in the 80s that he's, he's doing a second part to here in 2020 of all times. And um, so he's a big name, I guess. See, these are big names according to who? The world. You know what the Lord says? He looks at some of these people and he just laughs. And, and I, I say that. He, the Lord looks at him and, and I think the Lord probably sometimes grieves him that all the ability he gave them, and what are they using it for? For them. So don't go on the world's means of measuring greatness because you, you, you want to see who the Lord thinks is great? Just... Mark all the names off the list that the world thinks is great. Probably, you probably get it right most of the time, right? Go to Daniel chapter 2. Here, this goes right along with that. Daniel chapter 2. Look at verse 48. Uh, a little background here just so you can save some time here. This is where nobody can interpret the king's dream. And guess who can interpret the king's dream? Old Daniel comes along. And he does it. He interprets it. And the king is very impressed. Look at verse 48. Then the king, look at the wording here. The king made Daniel a What? A great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Now, it says that the king made him a great man. Did you know Daniel was a great man long before the, the king made him a great man? How was he able to interpret the dreams? The Lord miraculously gave him the ability to do that. And in the Lord's eyes, Daniel was already a great man. He didn't need Nebuchadnezzar to say you're a great man. Isn't that neat? So how do you become great? I'm glad you asked. Go over to Matthew chapter 20. How do you become great in God's eyes? Because that's what we're looking for, right? Forget about what the world says. The world calls you great. Oh boy, you better watch out. Not going to be right, uh, great in the Lord's eyes. I, mean, I know that's not always the case, but most of the time it is. Look at Matthew 20. 
Uh, Looking at this verse this afternoon with with our buddy Dan. Look at uh, 2026. It says, but, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be what? Your minister. There's greatness. Become one who ministers. Look at 27. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be what? Your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You know what? what uh, one of the many things that made the Lord Jesus Christ great, he came here as a lowly servant. Philippians 2. You see the humility of Jesus Christ, and then you see, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. You want to become great in God's sight, folks? you're probably not going to be much in the world's eyes. And that's okay. Because wouldn't you rather be great in the Lord's eyes? Become a servant. Become a minister. Minister to others. Let God use you. Even in the lowest of low positions, God will use you. Amen? In fact, he uses people in the lowest positions, oftentimes the greatest. I mean, can you imagine at the judgment seat of Christ? I've often thought of this, and I don't know for sure how this will be, but I got an idea. It might be like this. At the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord's going to greatly reward some folks you and I have never even heard of. They're not in the history books. We don't know about them today on the internet. They're just in some no-name place at some no-name church that hardly anybody knew about, and they're just plugging along. I, and I'm not even talking about necessarily has to be a pastor either. I'm just talking about a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. And anybody can qualify to be one of those, amen? So I got a feeling at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be surprised. The Lord might just say to the big names, you take a seat over there. You're last. You were first on earth. First shall be last, last shall be first. So wouldn't you much rather be last now and first then? Wouldn't you much rather say, I'll do without the rewards down here. If I just got a few bucks in my bank account to pay, pay the bills and eat some food and have a roof over my head, I'll be all right. I'll take the riches up there, amen? Isn't that better? How come? That's forever. That's eternal. Can't lose it. Down here, it gets lost, it gets stolen, it gets old and wears out. you got to buy a new one. Up there, not going to happen. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth, wrath nor must doth corrupt. Uh, robbers don't break through and steal. Okay, um, that's enough of that. Let's go back to this Genesis 13. Let's get this last point now. Got your hand out ready? First, first point tonight was the Lord, just talking about how to overcome rebellion through his word. Second point, the look. How do you look at things? Hopefully you look at things through the lens of God's word. And both of those points really go right, a, uh, right along with this last point. Let's go back to Genesis 13. I'll emphasize a certain word here. Look at verse 15. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Look at verse 17. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Uh, look at something here, by the way, before I get to this point. This is a neat little application. Look at where we started in verse 14. 14, it says, and the Lord said unto Abram, and he gives him some instruction there, tells him some things. Verse 17, the Lord tells him to arise, walk through the land. And look at verse 18. This is great application here. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto who? How did the, verse that we, the verses we, began, we read tonight, how did they begin? And the Lord. How does the chapter end? Unto the Lord. Verse 14, and the Lord said. Verse 18 ends. Uh, built an altar unto the Lord. You know what the, Lord, the, the word of the Lord ought to motivate us to do, folks? Get busy being in action and doing something unto the Lord. Great little lesson there just from that little passage. Now let's talk about this last thing here. Uh, God laid out a piece of real estate for Abram. And who else did he lay it out for? Abraham and his seed. That would be, uh, goes through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the 12 tribes. And uh, he says, I'm going to give that to you forever. So, um, Here's how we ought to look at our current situation in the world. What's happened this past week? Where's the action been in the world, folks? Iran, been in the news. I want you to look at your map here, and um, you'll see some interesting things here. This map is the modern-day map of the Middle East. 
you look at the top there, where the, where the, the graphics are. And um, let me just give you some, a layout of, of where certain things are before I get to some of the details. First off, can you find Israel? It's kind of hard to find, isn't it? How come it's so hard to find? Pretty small, isn't it? So you find Israel there, and then let's go to the east. Uh, just to the east of Israel, you eventually come to a place you ought to be familiar with, Iraq. You see the Iraq? Now, what's bigger, Iraq or Israel? Iraq's a whole lot bigger than Israel. Now, I bring up Iraq because Iraq has been in the news for a long time. 1991, the year I graduated from high school, early that year, uh, President George H.W. Bush decided to go into uh, Kuwait. You remember that? You find Kuwait there, a little tiny country there. Uh, Got to go a little bit southeast where Iraq is. You see Kuwait. Everybody see that? Well, uh, Saddam Hussein decided to go in there, and he started setting oil wells on fire and just uh, all kinds of crazy stuff going on there. And our president sent uh, American troops over there. It was Operation Desert Shield, turned into Operation Desert Storm, and we ran Saddam Hussein out of there. And um, didn't, didn't uh, do away with Saddam, though, at that time. Uh, you got to fast forward to, uh, oh, I can't remember what year it was. Finally, George W. Bush goes in there and takes care of Saddam Hussein. So isn't that interesting? Of all places, Iraq... Uh, one of the most prominent places in the news is according to the Middle East. Now, you know what modern-day Iraq was in biblical times? Help me out there. Babylon. Is that a prominent place in your Bible? Is it any surprise that Iraq would be the world's focus, at least from time to time, over the last, oh, 25 years or so? Makes perfect sense. Now, go to the country to the east of Iraq. It's not labeled on your, on your map there. You want to just guess what that country is? There it is. That's Iran. Iran, Iran, however you want to say it. There it is. And uh, that's been the focus here this last week. Now, if you remember back in the Gulf War, I remember this very clearly. In fact, this is when I, I just, little pieces began to come together to me, with me concerning Israel. And then I didn't really take a look at this for a long time after that. Many years passed. But little pieces came to my mind, came, came together because I remember watching the news and I remember watching American journalists in Israel during the Gulf War with gas masks on. You folks remember that? You remember seeing that? What were they, what they have gas masks on? Well, Iraq, not terribly far away from Israel. And you remember what Saddam Hussein did once uh, we got in there? Remember what he did? He fired those missiles. You remember what they were called? They were called Scud missiles. And he fired those things. Where, of all places, where did he fire them? Israel. His target was Israel. Now, why would he do that? Well, what is uh, his background? He's an Arab. He's a Muslim. What's the relationship between those people and the Jews like? Back then, a long time ago, and then today, what's it like? Uh, it's uh, a great strife, great, great conflict. So he launches those Scud missiles, and if you remember, the, the, uh, we, we had, um, America had those Patriot missiles. Remember that? Sherry's dad, actually, back when he was in the Army, worked on those things. And uh, that was many years before we actually put them into use. He had the early stages of that. And we shot those Patriot missiles up there and shot some of those, a lot of those scuds out of the sky. You remember that? And I remember thinking to myself, here we are, America, defending Israel. And I thought that was cool. But I had a hard time understanding at the time, why would this, this character, who, Saddam Hussein, what's he got against Israel? What did he, they do to him? And there is just a hatred that goes back, you're talking about a few thousand years, between the Arabs and the Jews. And uh, if we had time, we'd talk about Ishmael here, and you could understand why all his descendants, uh, he's a wild man, and every man's hand was against him. So uh, there you have a little layout there. Now, let's look at the big picture here. Notice on your map, I found this online, and I gave you the source down at the bottom. Uh, notice it's got the promised land laid out there. Now, wouldn't you say that the layout of the promised land is a whole lot bigger than the modern, the, the current 2020 nation of Israel? What, what do you say? I mean, I don't know what the proportion is, but you could fit at least, I would guess, 20 of the current state of Israel into that, into that uh, little land plot right there. Would you say? Say 20 or more? Okay. Now, how do you get the layout there? Okay, I put the verses on your, on your uh, sheet there so you'd have them. Folks, uh, when I look at this map through the lens of the Word of God, 
I see something really interesting. So look at Genesis 15. It's on your sheet there. Let's read that. Verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. Same land mentioned in chapter 13. From where? The river of Egypt. Okay, so let's stop there for a moment. You find Egypt there, and you see the really dark line going through Egypt. Do you see that? Guess what that line is right on top of? The Nile River. Isn't that the great river of Egypt? Okay, let's keep reading there in verse 18. It says, from the river of Egypt unto the great river. What river is that? The river Euphrates. Okay, go to the, the right side of your picture there. You see the squiggly line there that goes through Syria and Iraq, all the way down there uh, uh, near Kuwait. What do you think that squiggly line is? That line's right on top of the Euphrates River. And then... Uh, Whoever did this map just drew the line straight across there. Folks, that right there is the land grant that God promised to give to Abram and his seed for how long? When I look at the modern state of affairs in the Middle East through the lens of the word of God, all this makes perfect sense as to why everybody hates Israel. And if you look at Israel, Israel's right in the middle. I'll put this in the bulletin. Israel's right in the middle of a bunch of nations that... Um, I put that they're the only democracy in the region. That's true. Guess what else all the other nations are around them? They're all Arab nations. What do they think of the Jews? Hatred. Now, go back in your Bible here to uh, Genesis 12, and we'll, we'll probably end up here. I put Joshua 1, 4. You've got that thing re uh, repeated there. You want to see a real specific layout. I didn't have room to put it on here, but you can look at Numbers 34 and uh, see a little more specific layout with land, um, landmarks. But go over to Genesis 12. And uh, let's take a look here at what the Lord told Abram uh, concerning a couple different things. Look at verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a, there it is, a land that I will show thee. Ends up showing that land to him when he get over to chapter 13. We read that. Verse 2. And I will make of thee a great what? Nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Okay, just take verse 2 there. A great nation. Now, how does the world view the nation of Israel right now in 2020? I'm talking about the world. I'm talking about the unsaved world. How do they view Israel in 2020? You have more anti-Semitism, hatred for the Jews than you know, than you think. A lot of it is just not out in the open. It will be out in the open at some point, probably right here real soon, sooner than we think. So a great nation. Isn't that interesting? How does God view Israel? Great nation. How does the United Nations view Israel? Oh, those guys again. I mean, there's great hatred in that organization for that little tiny nation. Look how small they are compared to all the other nations. Why are they so, why all the hatred? Your Bible lays this thing out. That nation, those people have God's blessing on them. Now listen, let me clear something up. People in Israel today, uh, there's a lot of unsaved Jews in Israel. And I'm, I'm speaking biblically when I say this. Those Jews today that live over there, if they don't receive Jesus Christ, they're going to suffer the wrath of God. Uh, there's no way around that. That's not hatred for the Jew. That's just the truth. I had to tell a little boy at the camp several years ago. He asked me if I thought Jews, if God would send Jews to hell. And I told him, I said, the Bible says, <laughs> believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. That's how you, uh, you get to heaven. Anybody, Jew or Gentile. Now let's, let's stop though for a second and let's think about it. You take a look at a lot of the great discoveries in medicine, a lot of doctors over the centuries, guess what background they've had? They've been Jewish. God has given the Jew this ability to understand some things about our world, the natural world, that he didn't give to everybody. It's interesting when you start to look at the history of the Jews. And uh, think about 1940s, 1940 to 45, World War II. Holocaust is right in there, right? And of all the people for the dictator, Adolf Hitler, to hate, of all the people in the world, the Jews. And six million of them he, he put to death. And it's just interesting. When you study history, you see the Jew all throughout history, and you see a lot of hatred for the Jew all throughout history. How come? The world hates the thing that God blesses, even the nations that God blesses. Isn't that something? Look at verse 3 here. He says, uh, verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee. Now, praise the Lord that right now, at least right now, we have a president that is into blessing Israel. 
Amen. For eight years, we didn't have that. I was very concerned for those eight years. <laughs> uh, right now, it's uh, less of a concern. Our president, and again, I'm not saying anything spiritual about him. This was, I just believe this was a good decision because I'm looking at this through the lens of the Word of God. The Capitol was recognized by our country as what? See, even our president knows. He may not know all, all the reasons why. He knows there's something about that city. He knows there's something about that city. Could have something to do with his uh, Jewish son-in-law. Amen. I'm glad he's there. Uh, some, some great blessings because of that. Now, I will bless them that bless thee, and now look at the negative side. I curse him that curseth thee. So you want to pray that our nation is always on the side of Israel. Amen. All right, and then it says, in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Now, you know how all nations of the earth have the opportunity to be blessed right now? By blessing that nation. You know, I bet that would solve a lot of problems if everybody in the world would just bless that nation. But the world goes contrary to God's word, just time after time, day after day, don't they? And what are they going to reap? If they don't reap it now, they'll reap it in time. If the Bible says that God's going to curse those that curse Israel, what's going to happen to those nations? Have you read the Judgment of Nations over there in the book of Matthew? Guess what nations get rewarded at the end of the tribulation? The ones that bless the nation of Israel. Guess what nations don't get rewarded and get greatly punished? The ones that go against that nation. Folks, uh, I mean, there's a whole, we just covered a little bit of what's, what's here in chapter 12 and verse chapter 13. But I bring all this up uh, because uh, what's happening right now in the Middle East and in the days ahead should not surprise a Bible believer should be no surprise to you. So in these times, you ought to, I ought to, we ought to get our focus even more so up there. That's where we ought to look. You look at all the things around you, depressed, discouraged, disheartening. I mean, it's, you understand why there's depression in this world. When you look at the world from a worldly perspective, look up. Why look up? The Bible told me to. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, dead in Christ shall rise first. Uh, your life, they those that live remain, meet the Lord in the air. Look up. That'll keep your focus off of everything around you that very discouraging. And then point other people to look up too. I'm talking about fellow Christians and also unsaved folks. Hey, the answer's up there. Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. The answer is up there. And he gave us a book that came from up there. So we can point people to this book that tells them how to get up there through Jesus Christ. So, uh, hey, folks, uh, God's promises concerning salvation, concerning the nation of Israel, those are real. So you can, I mean, 100% of the time, the Lord's word is accurate, right, 100% of the time. You can trust it. So don't let these times grieve you and get you down Make these times, look at these times as, and I, I should thank God a lot more than I do for this. Look at these times as, thank you, Lord, for putting me in this time frame of all history to live. Because we're seeing some things come to pass that guys and, guys and ladies many years ago would love to have seen. We saw, we, uh, I didn't see it, but I seen the aftermath of Israel not being a nation for a long time and becoming a nation. My dad's 79, he's born in 40, so 48 is when that happened. So we got some folks in here that saw that. You may remember that actually happened. Praise the Lord, you were alive to see that. And I'm alive to see still today, there's that nation scattered all around the earth. Now that's a recognized nation. Whatever the UN says doesn't matter. It's a recognized nation. And our nation's blessing them. What a great time to be alive. You live in a country? Guess what we did Friday night? We handed out tracts telling people how they can be free. Even though they live in a physically free country, we're telling them how to have spiritual freedom through Jesus Christ. Folks, be excited about when we live, the time we live. It's exciting. It is exciting times. If you're looking at things through the lens of God's word. All right, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for uh, just showing us some really neat things out of your word. And we, we could go on and on about how great you are. We just thank you for putting us in this little time frame here, this little space of time. Oh, Lord, help us to look up, knowing that uh, you're coming here very soon, likely. Uh, may our, our focus be uh, upward rather than all of the nonsense around us. Lord, help us to do that this week. I, I, I certainly need to do that so much more. And uh, we just pray that we'd respond uh, in a manner that would honor you here in this invitation time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.